so much. Great. Wonderful. Great to see you. Well, let's get started. Um, I am mm -hmm. finishing up in the office, realities of <laughs> a typical work day. So um, yes. everyone, you can see my lovely background. But we're so excited to have you all join today. Um, this is our seven Starling webinar series designed to give you healthcare providers across specialties pearls to feel, help you feel more confident in supporting your patients with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Today's webinar is titled what, PMADS 101, and Dr. Crystal Clark is here to help us um, kind of break down how we're going to, how we can think about um, SSRIs. But before we get started, my name is Nazanin Homofar, and I'm a practicing uh, OBGYN in Northern Virginia and the medical director at Seven Starling. Seven Starling is a digital mental health solution that provides virtual, individual, and group therapy for the full spectrum of women's health needs, including miscarriage and infertility, and prenatal and postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. And I'm thrilled to be joined again. This is our second webinar by Dr. Crystal Clark, uh, who is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral health sciences and, um, and obstetrics and gynecology at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. She specializes in mood and anxiety disorders and is an expert in the treatment of women's mental health across the reproductive lifespan. She has dedicated her career to reproductive psychiatry and the advancement of maternal mental health. She is a researcher, educator, clinician, and thought leader, and also an advisor to Seven Starling. So I'm excited to, to kick off this, our second webinar with you and talk about um, SSRIs. Thanks for joining us. Well, as always, thanks for having me. So yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> Absolutely. And let me um, pull up. I have pulled up the wrong meeting notes. So okay. give me a second. <laughs> oh my goodness, everyone. It is Thursday and the end of the week. The end of a week. Maybe a long week for some of us. I know it's been a long yes. week for me. <laughs> I can imagine. So today, um, Dr. Clark, just to, to set the tone to everyone, we are, for everyone, we're covering the basics of prescribing selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for perinatal and postpartum anxiety and depression. We mm -hmm. know that SSRIs are the mainstay of treatment for perinatal depression and anxiety as a complement to therapy or potentially on its own. And as we get more comfortable discussing perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and screening for them in our practice, we may mm -hmm. find ourselves needing to prescribe medication. Actually, amongst our providers who are on the, um, on the list, can you raise your hand um, if you prescribe medications already? It'd be interesting to get a show of hands. That's okay, mm -hmm. almost, almost half of our um, of our audience members already prescribed medications. Um, thanks for that show of hands. Um, are I'm, these uh, OBs or I'm just trying to figure out who's... You know, we don't have a poll set up. Okay. Um, people can send in the chat, but I think we have a mix today just by, okay. based on some of the, um, uh, the names I'm seeing. But if people want to send us um, right. their professions in the chat, that would be yeah. great. Yeah, I've been lucky... Sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I've been lucky to work in healthcare settings where I've been able to reach out to a friend in psychiatry. It's great to have your cell phone number, Dr. Clark, but I know not everyone can or <laughs> for patients for whom medication initiation is necessary. But I've also had situations where I was told the wait time was long and others when I thought it was important to start someone on pharmacologic therapy immediately. So in the next 25 minutes, we'll talk about when to prescribe SSRIs how to counsel your patients on initiating SSRIs in pregnancy and postpartum, and how to prescribe three SSRIs for this time period. Um, let's jump in. So Dr. Clark, when do you recommend prescribing SSRIs for patients who are pregnant or postpartum? Is it based on their EPDS or PHQ-9 score? Um, so I, I think, in, and I saw, thank you all for uh, sharing, you know, um, what your profession is. So several OBs on, 
on this webinar. And I, I think um, this is a great question. I think a very practical tool um, that can be used in OB offices. I would say me as a, a psychiatrist, I, I don't depend as much on the EPDS or <clears throat> EHQ-9. I'm depending a lot on my clinical evaluation, but I do often use those assessments just as um, if nothing more, it's for a good kind of monitoring um, tool for the patient and, um, you know, it's good for them to see their numbers change and go down and all of that. But it also can be a good insurance tool for, for FMLA because sometimes they want a real clear like measurements. Um, but I think um, the most practical way to use it if you, um, you know, even in, if you're crunched for time or something or in the um, primary care office like the OB-GYN's office, um, really thinking about the cutoff points for the EPDS at 14, so anything less than 14 being considered mild to um, minimal, you know, depending on where they are in that range. So zero to six would be like, you know, minimal to no depression and seven to 13 would be uh, mild depression. And anything above that, that um, 13 would be moderate to severe depression, depending on where they fall. And so when I'm thinking about when to prescribe SSRIs, I am thinking about, are they having mild or moderate or severe symptoms and anything mild, um, anything moderate to severe is when I'm thinking, okay, they need a, um, an antidepressant. We need to start some treatment. Now that doesn't mean you can't start treatment for someone who's having mild symptoms. I sometimes say, hey, it, you know, it depends on how long we want to suffer with this. I mean, we can definitely start with therapy, but it's going to take longer, uh, whereas there's a much quicker response to um, SSRIs. So it, it, it will definitely come down to the patient's preference on what they feel most comfortable with. Um, and even sometimes that's the case with moderate to severe um, symptoms. They may still feel more comfortable with starting psychotherapy. And I, you know, I tell them, you know, why I think one or the other is best and we go from there. Uh, similarly, with the PHQ-9, um, scores over 10 indicate moderate to severe depression. So um, that, that would be the kind of marker or the threshold that would make me be more compelled to highly recommend um, treatment with an SSRI. And the reason being is that there's a risk that this is going to keep getting worse. And, and then, you know, you're also making sure to look for um, those, uh, the two questions on the EPDS or uh, the one on the EPDS or the one on the PHQ-9 that indicates the risk for self-harm. And if you have someone who may not have plan or intents for suicide, but is even just having those wishes, you really don't want them to stay in that state uh, longer than necessary. So antidepressants, um, especially the SSRIs are a good, good time to start if, if they're having some of those symptoms. So, and very helpful. So to recap, for moderate to severe symptoms, you can go ahead and, and discuss initiation. Mild mm -hmm. symptoms, depending on how the patient is doing, whether or not you think, talk, depending on how if they are established in therapy and how much time you think it's going to take to help them, it is very reasonable to start the discussion mm -hmm. and and potentially offer it. Did yeah, I get that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And so I guess, I don't know if this, I think this ties into what you said, but to clarify for some people, how mm -hmm. long do you usually wait for talk therapy to work if you're, if they're seeing someone? That's a great question. So a lot of the manualized therapies that we, that, um, are being most utilized today, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which is uh, one of the most popular. We're really thinking about eight to 12 sessions. Ideally, those sessions will okay. be weekly. So we're thinking, you know, three months. And that's that's an average. Of course, those sessions can go longer, um, if, depending on how well the patient is doing. But yeah, we're thinking the average of three to four months. Um, whereas, just to give you a sense, if it is a um, hormonally triggered depression onset um, in this patient that's pregnant or postpartum, we can sometimes see responses to SSRIs within a week or two, not the typical four to six weeks that we're, we typically talk about in the non-pregnant patient. So there can definitely be a huge variability in how quick this, this patient is going to get better. I think that's a really mm -hmm. important pearl to keep in mind, mm -hmm. that when you are postpartum or pregnant, you would expect that as if it's hormonally driven, mm -hmm. I'm just repeating what you said, that you would expect the SSRIs to be effective within two to four weeks, mm -hmm. rather than sometimes, I think I've, I've quoted people four to six weeks if they're not pregnant. Yeah. Did I get that yeah, correct? 
Yeah, even less than four weeks. I'm thinking two weeks, one to two, two weeks. weeks. Um, okay. They might, you know, may not be fully remitted, but will um, start to say they're, they're feeling better. They're, they're noticing some improvement. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, compared to that four to six weeks, yeah, that we're all kind of ingrained in exactly. our heads. Like four to six weeks, it's going to take four to six weeks. Um, now, with that said, just to give the caveat, there are some people where it's not hormonally triggered. They do have a recurrence for other reasons. Um, and those are usually people who have a history already of depression, anxiety, or something prior to mm -hmm. pregnancy. And, um, and you may not see that same quick response, but more often than not, if that's hormonally driven um, in that perinatal period, very quick response. Sounds good. And we'll talk about it in a few questions about how to determine if you need to up titrate someone. Um, do you use, sorry, my, my next question was going to be like, are there any SSRIs that are more risky or should it be prescribed in pregnancy? How do you talk about that to patients? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, no, I'll start with no, uh, there's no SSRIs that should not be used. But of course, when that question comes up, people are like, well, what about Paxil, um, also known as paracetine? And I have to remind people that yes, in 2006, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, or also known as GSK, the manufacturer, uh, put out a warning label on the um, the Paxil bottle or box saying, you know, this is a warning to pregnant women due to the concern of an associated increased risk for cardiovascular malformations. However, since then, um, several databases and studies have, have shown that there is no known associated risk. When we look at um, the mother risk database of 3,000 exposures in uh, Toronto, there in 2008, they could not prove any association with paroxetine and cardiovascular risk no increased association anyhow. And then a recent study by Hybergs et al. out of Mass General looked at a huge um, public database of almost a million women. And then she broke that database down. There were a million pregnant women to be specific, then restricted that population to only those that were depressed, taking Paxil um, during pregnancy, looked at uh, first trimester exposure, and then broke it down even further to adjust for confounding variables. Um, so these, these were um, you know, kind of matched populations and they could not prove an association between paroxetine and cardiovascular risk. So with that said, there are some controversies still. There are some studies you know, that have been done prior to these that suggested there was a risk and, and maybe one other study uh, in between uh, these publications that suggested some risk. So there's a little bit of controversy, um, which still has us a little cautious, like, okay, it looks pretty promising based on mm -hmm. uh, some of the best data out there, but may, may not be your first line. You know, maybe you're not gonna go to Paxil first, yeah. but there's no reason to stop somebody who's taking that medication when it's effectively uh, working for them or, or, or any reason to, you know, be, alarmed with them taking it during pregnancy or postpartum. I think that's key. So that <laughs> if someone is entering into the pregnancy on a medication that they're well controlled, we do not need to change that medication. However, if we're initiating medication in pregnancy and postpartum, there might be some that we preferentially pick, mm -hmm. but the safety, it sounds like the safety data is generally um, there for all of the medications. Yeah, absolutely. that exists. And I'll remind, and people might already know this, but some of my favorite resources to give my patients um, come from mothertobaby.org. They have fantastic fact sheets and you can put the fact sheet, give it to the patient to read because it really spells out the risk of birth defects or the risk of miscarriage and, and gives them the research. And Dr. Clark, do you do you remember, I know there's a national registry for medication, for um medications that the more data we can gather, the better. Maybe I will try and find that and send it to everyone later, but do you happen to know the name of the registry? Yeah, so Mass General has a registry for just about everything uh, related to pregnancy exposures these days. Um, they started out uh, really focused on second generation antipsychotics, but I'm pretty sure that um, the, I think the last registry that they built some years ago was for SSRI. So um, I don't yeah. know the link off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure, you know, 
look at that women's mental health.org. Um, there should be a link we'll on that, that website. I will, and I'll include it in the next newsletter, provider newsletter mm -hmm. that I send out. Um, okay. I knew we should have had more time. We're almost halfway through. Let me <laughs> continue. Um, <laughs> Do you, one thing I've always wondered is with SSRIs, do you use the same type of SSRI and dosing for anxiety versus depression? Yeah, easy answer there. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, the, the only caveat is that sometimes with anxiety, the doses need to go higher. So for okay. instance, um, max dose per package insert for sertraline is 200. We might go to 250, 300 for someone with bad anxiety. Okay. So you should think, so one should think that shouldn't be too alarmed if you see someone on higher doses of SSRIs, mm -hmm. if their diagnosis is anxiety versus mm -hmm. depression. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's, there's some other caveats there, but yes, I think the take home is should not be alarmed. It's likely because, um, you know, they just haven't been responsive to lower doses and it's very typical and common in practice to go above those max doses to treat anxiety. Okay. Um, we have a question from the chat saying, when we're talking about medications, are we talking about all SSRIs or all depression meds? And I think specifically for the anxiety and depression, were we were you referring to the SSRIs? Yeah, um, uh, this conversation is definitely more focused on SSRIs. So I'm not referring to, you know, Wellbutrin or also known as Bupropion or Venlafaxine or Mirtazapine, none of those. Thanks for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so let's jump into the meat of our conversation, which is how do you counsel your patients about starting SSRIs? What about SSRI exposure and breastfeeding? Yeah, so um, I counsel my patients. I, I try to dispel myths, first of all, because um, you, you have to at least take five minutes. You'll know the patient who's like, I don't care. I just need to start something <laughs> versus that patient who's like, oh, my gosh, this is some type of doomed fate. <laughs> you know, how can I is there any way I can try to control my my brain? Um, and I just try to dispel myths. This is not gonna. This is not a chemical dependency. This, this is not a drug they're gonna be hooked on. This is not a drug that will change their brain permanently. Um, we wish actually, because if, if it was a cure, it'd be great. So I try to dispel those myths um, and let them know everything's. Uh, unfortunately, everything's quite reversible. Um, you know, for good or bad. So we discuss that, and then I just let them know that it's very much can be trial or error too. So. You know, the first thing we try may not work. Don't be discouraged. They may not feel great right away. Um, and don't be discouraged by that either. You know, if, if they are a person in the event that it takes longer for them to get a response. I think there was a second part to your question. Yeah, I think that's super. I think that's very <laughs> important. And how, what do you usually say to them about the exposure while they're breastfeeding or chest feeding or pumping? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Uh, so again, the, the safety profiles here look really good and, and continue to uh, seem promising. There, there is some variability in how much exposure amongst the SSRIs. So we know, for instance, sertraline has the least or, or is one of the ones with the least exposure. It's quite negligible, sometimes not even quantifiable when we go to look for the concentration in the um, breast milk or the baby. Um, whereas on the other extreme, citalopram, fluoxetine, and venlafaxine have higher rates of exposure. Um, so we see higher levels in the, um, the baby's uh, blood as well as in the mom's breast milk. And there was some concern about that. Um, for some time, like, oh, this is a higher exposure. Does that, what does that mean? There have been some case reports associated associate with those higher exposures, but nothing that has suggested that there will be infant uh, neurodevelopmental delays or any bad outcomes. It's been hard to tease out what the case is because it's like, is it coincidental or is it, you know, is it just so happens that the baby is fussy and they happen to also be <laughs> um, exposed to, uh, I don't know, fluoxetine, it's been hard to tease out those variables. So there, there hasn't been any conclusive data suggesting that um, it's bad to breastfeed on those medications. Very helpful for me. I just remember in res residency, it was like you start sertraline, sorry. Um, <laughs> and that's the medication you use for lactation. And I think just understanding how to talk about the data 
probably mm-hmm. we're still going to opt for sertraline, but just knowing that if that's mm-hmm. not working for the patient, it's safe to, to use something else is really mm-hmm. reassuring. Mm-hmm. On that note, mm-hmm. um, what are some of, what are a few SSRIs that you typically prescribe for perinatal and postpartum anxiety and depression? And could you tell us how you titrate it up and over what time course? Yeah, um, absolutely. And some side effects. Yeah, so um, so I'll give I'll give three. Um, Sertraline, of course, is one of them. It is not the one I start all the time uh, first. I know that uh, that is really common because for whatever reason it just caught on and we've just ran with it. And it's good. So there's a lot of good data because we've used it for uh, so long and so much. Um, I start that one at. Um, it depends on the patient. So I'll start in a perinatal patient, I'll start at 25 milligrams. The reason being is it has a, a good serotonergic um, impact when, when you start sertraline. And for, uh, because of that, some women will be very sensitive. So you don't want them to run away from taking the medication, feel that discomfort. So starting less than um, the typical 50 milligram start and starting at 25 helps them to ease into the medication. Um, and tolerated better. And then after a week going up to 50 um, and then holding there for, you know, four to six weeks. Now, again, I'm I'm saying hold there for about the time that we would normally um, expect uh, just to give them time to fully um, appreciate all the benefits or the effect of the medication. Uh, You can definitely go up sooner than that if you notice that nothing's happened at all in like two or three weeks. in terms of another one, Lexapro is one I commonly use. Oh, go ahead. Can I ask you really quickly about mm-hmm. the sertraline? So you said you start at 25 and then you would keep it there for a week or two to see the effect. And then you would work up, was it like 12.5 milligrams every yeah. week until you get to 50? Or could you just jump to the 50? You could just jump to the 50 or okay. um, in the very anxious patient, I might start even lower at 12.5 because they're just... The anxious patient who is also very anxious about starting medication will swear they feel every little thing that it's like, I felt a twinge when I started, you know, it's like they're really, Mm -hmm. really anxious. So any type of side effect that they experienced earlier on is going to be exacerbated. So I might start at 12.5 and then go up by 12.5 weekly as long as they're tolerating it until we get to 50 and then we'll hold there for a little while. Um, Thank you for that. Lexapro would be another one. And um, again, this is a drug that starts at 10 milligrams. The max is typically uh, 30, although the package insert says 20, just just noting that. Um, I might start at five, again, trying to be sensitive to that person who's naive to an SSRI. If they're not SSRI naive, you know, I, this is a drug I'll just go straight in at 10. And, um, and again, give some weeks, you know, at least a month to see if they're responding unless they just have severe symptoms. And it, it seems like, okay, they're worsening, then we're going to go up a little bit quicker. But four weeks is a good um, time to let it fully take effect, although okay. you might see response well before then. And then, you know, you can go up to 20 or 30 um, as needed. And finally, Prozac would be the, the other one. I really like this drug for those who can't remember to take their medication. <laughs> it's a very long acting drug. Uh, so if they won't notice those effects of, oh, I, I missed it for half a day. Not that we're encouraging them to you know, skip a couple of days or anything, but um, that drug starts at uh, 20 milligrams, goes up to 80, um, typically by 20 milligram increments. I'll usually start that one again for the naive person at 10 and um, and then go up by 10 milligrams to get to that 20, which is the starting dose. I usually just kind of hold at the starting therapeutic dose and, and see how they do um, and then increase as needed uh, every, you know, like four weeks, um, if not sooner for other concerns. I am taking notes. <laughs> I <laughs> So, and then what are the side, are the side effects kind of the same for all of them? Or do you notice that of the three you mentioned, sertraline, escitalopram, and fluoxetine, that one of them has a better side effect profile? Not really. You know, it's really not a one size fits all. It's so variable across individuals. So I, I, um, I just warn everyone that they might have a headache, they might experience some GI upset, which could be nausea or diarrhea. Um, they might experience sweating or um, nervousness, which is not quite as common, but some people do experience it. 
And, and I warned them that sexual side effects when they feel better, because usually that's not, that's the least of their concerns at the moment, but I warned them that sexual side effects could be an issue too. And that's something we should revisit once they're doing better. Thank you. And that's, I actually, I was listening to a podcast once with Emily Nagoski, I think, I don't know if I said her name correctly, but she is a sex therapist and she has been on SSRIs for a long time. And she said, you know, one thing that I have found helpful is to say that libido is going to be different. It doesn't necessarily mean it's worse. Mm -hmm. And I think reminding people to, to reframe it like that, if you hear something that like, it's going mm -hmm. to kill your libido or it's going to decrease your libido. Yeah. I think you're going to associate that with something negative. But yeah. she was like, but do I want to be able to have sex and not want to kill myself or like not want to be so <laughs> depressed? Like, absolutely. So I think reframing it as um, it is going to change your libido, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to and that will be different, but it doesn't have to be a negative thing is helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I'll um, add, um, it can be quite, it, I, and I agree, I think that's a great way to put it, because you, you don't want to scare people away. But I would also add that for some people, it can be quite severe, like they cannot reach okay. a climax, they can't reach an orgasm, they lose libido altogether. And those are the people where I, I definitely want to check in, like, okay, that's not the goal of this treatment, we might need to try something else or add something, well, butrin is a common add-on or adjunct later to reverse some of those effects and typically does do that very well, like low dose, 150 milligrams XL. Um, and, and others, like she said, it'll just be changed and they're mm -hmm. still, doesn't mean you don't have any or that you can't reach a climax, it's just different. And, and that's a, I absolutely agree. That's a different um, scenario. Doesn't mean stop your SSRI. We want you to be, um, you know, functional and, living life and um, and thriving. I like to say thriving. Absolutely. Yes. And we had a, I think you answered this with the Wellbutrin, but one of um, the questions are, do you have anything else for help with the sexual side effects? So it sounds like you could consider adding Wellbutrin XL starting at 150. Mm -hmm. Anything else so that patients don't necessarily discontinue their, their yeah. medication? No, to the point of the uh, doc you were talking about, um, I think it's very important that after having children, it's easy to equate everything to like, I have no sex drive because I'm you know, dealing with a child. So I encourage people to first try to make some date nights and actually <laughs> try to um, make sure they are trying to be in the mood um, uh, to explore you know, where things are. And sometimes they find that, oh, actually, yeah, I actually enjoyed that. I just I was just too tired every other day. So I, I encourage date nights and you know, just making time. I think that's great. And I think um, in case people on this call haven't heard, Meet Rosie is a fantastic app that deals with sexual wellness and health and has a dedicated course on postpartum sexual health or perinatal sexual health. And I think it's just helpful to, to educate people on what to expect and to normalize some of it and give them resources mm -hmm. because they do have access to sexual sex therapist. And also sometimes seeing a sex therapist can, can help, but yeah. we can potentially have another session on yes. that. <laughs> I know we started two minutes late, so I'm going to ask for two minutes of your time if that's yeah, yeah. okay, Fine. Dr. Clark. So to recap, um, the takeaway that I heard from the SSRIs that you go to are, um, sertraline, escitalopram, or Lexapro, and then the third one was fluoxetine with sertraline um, for a patient who is SSRI naive, we would potentially start at 25 milligrams, maybe even 12.5, and go up every week or two depending on how they're doing with the goal of getting them to 50 milligrams and keeping them there for a while. Did I get that correct? Yes. Okay. And then for escitalopram or Lexapro, you can start at five or 10 milligrams mm -hmm. and increase to 10, um, every 10 milligrams with the max dose on the package is 20 milligrams, but we can go up to 30 milligrams as needed. Mm -hmm. And then for fluoxetine, it's great for someone who might not be able to remember taking their medications because it's a longer half-life. Um, on that note, also for sertraline, you said it's been the most studied and then the studies have shown that it could be undetectable um, in people who are breastfeeding. But mm -hmm. for fluoxetine, we start at 10 milligrams and increase to 20 milligrams 
in one week, continue to continue that for four to six weeks and then reassess. And that goes up all the way to 80 milligrams. Exactly. Did I? Great. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got so many extra things in my toolbox um, this week. <laughs> Thank you so much for this crash course, Dr. Clark, um, in prescribing SSRIs. I will ask if there is, I, are there any questions in the chat? We might be able to answer one. And if not, I just want to say to the providers who joined us today, um, we hope you found these 30 minutes engaging and informative. Sorry for some of the technical difficulties. At Seven Starling, we are committed to providing excellent perinatal mental health care and would love to support you and your patients. Please check out our website, sevenstarling.com, to learn more about how we may be able to help you in your own practice. Um, right now in Virginia, Maryland, and DC. If you like this webinar, please subscribe to our newsletter so we can keep you informed about future events. And I hope everyone has a great night. Dr. Clark, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, right. Thanks for having me. Great. Oh, I one question. How yeah, soon do you yeah. consider, consider adding Wellbutrin for sexual effects of SSRIs? I want to, um, you want to see their symptoms improve. So if you're using, you know, the PHQ-9 as a way to, or EPDS as a way to monitor, you want to see that they actually either are down to minimal symptoms or complete remission before you start adding something um, to, to take off those symptoms because depression and anxiety itself can affect libido. So you don't want to be trying to um, uh, prematurely add on another medication. Okay. Great. And I will, we have a few more questions, but maybe we can try and answer them um, in an email to everyone. Okay. Happy to do that. Well, thanks so much for having me. I hope this was helpful and I look forward to sharing more. Absolutely. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Bye.